Vsauce, I'm Jake, and there have been a number of articles and videos about why Mario might not be the hero. However, we're going to talk about it a bit differently, a bit more psychologically. But first, we need to find out why Mario might be bad to begin with. So here are a few popular examples. Mario has no problem sacrificing his friend Yoshi into an abyss to save his own life. In the instruction booklet for Super Mario Bros, it mentions how the mushroom people were turned into stones, bricks, and horsehair plants. So it can be concluded that those bricks Mario punches through are actually the transformed people he is supposed to be saving. Now, knowing what we do, let's ask the question, is Mario evil? Well, what is evil? In James Waller's incredible book, Becoming Evil, he defines it as the deliberate harming of humans by other humans. In The Lucifer Effect, psychologist Philip Zimbardo says evil is intentionally behaving in ways that harm, abuse, demean, dehumanize, or destroy innocent others. So now is Mario evil? I mean, his actions don't harm people. The instruction manual makes that very clear. Whenever it talks about those who you are trying to rescue or protect, it uses the word people. The Mushroom People. The daughter of the Mushroom King. It is humanizing. And we can obviously relate to people. We can put value in people. But a tribe of turtles and the Turtle King? Well, it's easier to not identify with turtles, especially when the booklet generalizes them all as bad guys. We are told this by what is ostensibly the authority on the game. I mean, it was written by the people who made the game, so why would they put us in a compromising situation? In 1961, psychologist Stanley Milgram began conducting a social psychology experiment. It involved three people. The experimenter, who acted as the authority figure, the teacher, the subject, and the learner, who is secretly part of the experiment as well. In the main room is the experimenter, and the teacher with a control board. And in the other room was the learner, who was connected by electrodes to the board in the main room. If the learner answered one of the teacher's questions wrong, the teacher was instructed to give them a shock and increase it by 15 volts for every incorrect response. But there were never any shocks delivered. The teacher just thought they were. And since the teacher and learner were in two separate rooms, they couldn't see each other. A pre-recorded tape of the learner yelling and protesting would play as the shocks got more severe. Watch how the teacher, the subject, reacts. Wrong. Answer is day. 285 volts. Continue, please. Fat. Man, lady, cub. In the first set of experiments out of 40 people, 65% continued all the way to the end, delivering a supposed 450 volts. In Milgram's book on the experiment, Obedience to Authority, he mentions how some of the teachers said that the person receiving the shocks was so stupid and stubborn that he deserved to get shocked. If they had just answered the questions correctly, well, this never would have happened. Let's look at the Goombas, who we are told betrayed the Mushroom Kingdom. Do they deserve to be punished? To be killed? Well, they're untrustworthy, they're not human, and they're stupid. They'll just walk off the ledge if you let them, so maybe they deserve to be squashed. Something is happening in our minds. Two things, actually, and we might not be entirely conscious of them. Let's use some brain craft to help explain confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is where you interpret, remember, or actively seek information that confirms your already existing beliefs. The more emotionally charged, the deeper the belief. For example, during the 2004 United States presidential election, neuroscientists did a study where they placed people in an MRI machine to monitor their brain activity. When the subjects who were pro-President Bush heard information that was dissonant or didn't agree with what they already thought, the reasoning areas of their brain didn't respond. But when they were told information they agreed with, the emotional areas of the brain lit up. The same thing occurred with the subjects who favored candidate John Kerry. This is also a sign of cognitive dissonance. That feeling that you get when you recognize that something isn't logically consistent. Like knowing that you've acted in a way that goes against your core values or principles. In fact, if we watch the Milgram Experiment video, you can see it happening in this subject. Mm. Let me out! That guy's 
comment on that. Continue, please. Go on. Condition there. You want me to go? Just continue, please. Sh sharp. Axe, needle, stick, blade. Answer, please. Wrong. And when faced with this dissonance, we tend to convince ourselves that what we did was right, that the person deserved to be shot, or that it was out of our control. I mean, the fellow in there is hollering. He says, I don't want to do it. I want to, I want to get out of here. I want to get out of here. Why, why didn't you stop anyway? I, w I did stop, but he kept going. Keep going. But why did you just disregard what he said? He says it's got to go on, the experiment. In Mistakes Were Made, but not by me, Carol Tavris and Elliot Aronson talk about the power of irrevocability. The more costly a decision, the more irrevocable its consequences, the greater the dissonance, and the greater the need to reduce it by overemphasizing the good things about the choice made. From cognitive dissonance, we try to find cognitive consistency. When it comes to crushing hundreds of Goombas, or jumping on turtles and kicking them into pits, we need to justify those actions. I mean, they can't be innocent, right? Well, of course not! They helped kidnap the princess, so killing thousands of them is totally worth it to save the life of one princess. Let's look at it from a different angle. Let's argue that the Goombas don't do any harm. They walk back and forth minding their own business and are literally only a threat if you walk directly into them. Did we ever take the time to learn about them, to find out what they do, what they like? No, because the manual says that they are bad, and we take that as fact because it comes from a place of authority. And the dehumanizing of these characters is very important. They are explicitly not people. They're monsters, creatures, animals. There is us, and then there is them. Us and them is also known as in-groups and out-groups. In-group bias is the belief that your group is better than any other group, called out-groups. Your in-groups are those you identify yourself with, like your family, your college, or a sports team. This bias can even get personal. In 1968, Iowa teacher Jane Elliott divided her third grade class on the basis of their eye color, blue or brown. She told the blue-eyed children they were the better people in this room. Almost immediately, the blue-eyed children started calling the brown-eyed children stupid, and they wouldn't sit with them in the playground. The blue-eyed children turned against the brown-eyed ones simply because they were told they were better. I felt like I was a king, like I ruled them brown eyes, like I was better than them. As Professor James Waller states, the mere act of placing people into groups leads to a bias. Then once in a group, we can go a step further and we can start categorizing them with inhuman names, like monster or animal or demon. In Japanese, Bowser's name literally translates to the great demon king. He's the enemy. And it's usually not an enemy or our enemy, it's the enemy. The definite article that makes it immutable, unchangeable. Now obviously in Super Mario Bros, the bad guys aren't physically human, so it doesn't make sense to represent them as such. But we don't have to change the physical appearance of an individual or a group to change how we feel about them, to change how we treat them. It could be something as innocuous as going from calling them a student to calling them a prisoner. The Stanford Prison Experiment is one of the most famous and controversial psychological studies. Conducted in August 1971, 24 psychologically normal students were selected and placed in a mock prison in the basement of a Stanford University building. 12 were randomly selected as guards, and the other 12 as prisoners. What was supposed to be a two-week experiment had to be stopped after only six days. The guards became increasingly sadistic, taking away their clothes, their mattresses, ridiculing and mocking the other students. The difference between those two groups was their group designation, either prisoners or guards. And it's crazy to think how quickly it devolved, given that everyone involved knew that it was an experiment. But it only took a few days for the people to forget that. Once you put a uniform on and are given a role, I mean, uh, a job, saying your job is to keep these people in mind, then you're not certainly not the same person as if you're in street clothes and in a different role. You really 
become that person once you put on that khaki uniform, you put on the glasses, you put on, you take the nightstick, and you know, you, you act the part. That's your, that's your costume, and uh, you have to uh, act accordingly. He was just doing his job. During the experiment, he doesn't think of himself as evil, or that his actions are evil. Just like Mario doesn't think he's evil. He thinks what he's doing is the right thing to do. He's saving the Mushroom Kingdom. But on the other hand, King Koopa probably thinks the same thing. He thinks that his actions are justified, and that Mario is actually the bad guy. Most people who we consider evil don't think of themselves as evil. So again, we have to ask ourselves, is Mario evil? Or is he just a normal person put in an abnormal situation? It's easy to stand on the sidelines and form an opinion without you yourself experiencing it. What would we do in Mario's situation? Well, we already know. We are the ones controlling Mario. His actions are our own. Just like in Milgram's experiment, we are the people delivering the shocks. And just like those people, we feel we have to continue. It's the only way. We have to continue because we need to win. That's what we've been told to do. I recently replayed the first Super Mario Bros, and you can play the whole game without killing or harming any characters. Besides King Koopa, he is the only one that you have to hurt to win. The rest of the game can be played by avoiding everyone else. So why do we generally choose to kill them? Is it because we get more points? Is it because the game manual, the authority, tells us to? It might not seem like you have a choice, but just like the people in Milgram's experiment, you can stop. Or in the case of Super Mario Bros, you can choose to play the game differently. If we admit that Mario is evil, are we also saying that we are evil? But in all of these judgments we make, there is this moral question of what is right and wrong. What is good and evil? It's a dilemma. Are you a hero like the Mario we're led to believe in? Or are your actions evil? There's a thought experiment we can do that might be able to help answer this. So, can you solve this dilemma? Follow me over to BrainCraft to find out. And, as always, thanks for watching.